Guten Nachmittag, äh, guten Abend. Ich freue mich sehr, ähm, euch alle zu unserem heutigen Fireset, äh, Fireside Chat begrüßen zu dürfen. Ähm, es kommen gerade noch ganz viele Teilnehmer aus dem virtuellen Raum in unseren äh, Fireside Chat. Deswegen warten wir noch ein paar Sekunden. Das ist immer diese, diese awkward Zeit am Anfang von Zoom-Meetings wo alle rein müssen vom Warteraum in den Hauptraum und, äh, und den überbrücken wir jetzt einfach. Wir haben gesagt, äh, Verena und ich, indem wir nett, nett lächeln, bis alle dann da sind. Gefriert mein Gesicht hier schon, ja, genau. aber ich mache weiter. Dann, dann legen wir jetzt auch los. Ähm, es wäre sehr, sehr viel schöner gewesen, ähm, euch alle ähm, in persona hier in Berlin begrüßen zu dürfen. Ähm, auf der anderen Seite ähm, ist es in diesen Zeiten ja immer noch schwer, ähm, tatsächlich Veranstaltungen on the ground zu machen. Und ähm, ich sage auch immer so, können ähm, auch unsere Mitglieder, Vorstand, Kuratorium und, und, und weit darüber hinaus ähm, auch viel einfacher mitmachen, die nicht in Berlin sind, ähm, sondern irgendwo anders. Ich sehe zum Beispiel Margit, ähm, die aus Frankfurt sich dazu geschaltet hat. Das ginge alles nicht, wenn wir nur Dinge in Berlin machen würden. Und es ist auch manchmal ein bisschen einfacher, es einzutakten zwischen Arbeitstag, Kita, ähm, Schule. Auch das ist manchmal ein bisschen einfacher, wenn man es digital macht. Bei mir ist ein relativ starkes Nebengeräusch. Ich weiß nicht, ob das anderen auch so geht. Vielleicht noch mal einmal gucken, ob alle lautlos sind. Oder? Ich glaube, es müsste bei Stormy liegen. Ich weiß nicht, ob du vielleicht deine Hand auf dem Mikro so hast, weil eigentlich sind alle stumm geschaltet. Ah, okay. Super. Muss ich mal gucken, dass es bei, ist es jetzt besser bei mir? Aha. So, also man müsste glauben, dass nach zwei Jahren man alles äh, schon mal im Griff bekommen hat, das aber nicht. <lacht> Vielen Dank. Ähm, ja, ähm, und ihr habt schon gesehen, wir haben heute einen ganz, ganz besonderen Gast ähm, bei uns, ähm, nämlich Verena Pauster. Unsere Fireside-Chats sind was Besonderes, weil wir anders als in anderen ESPEN-Formaten es nicht nur um den Inhalt geht, ähm, sondern auch vor allen Dingen um die Person. Und anders als in vielen anderen Formaten soll dies keines sein, das rein frontal ist, ähm, wo ihr alle nur zuhört, sondern wo wir miteinander sprechen wollen, ins Gespräch kommen und vor allen Dingen auch voneinander lernen wollen. Deswegen für nachher, das ist schon mal ganz wichtig, ähm, lasst bitte, bitte alle eure Kamera an ähm, oder, oder schaltet sie an, wenn ihr es noch nicht habt und bereitet euch auch vor, später reinzuspringen in die Diskussion und zwar nicht nur äh, per Chat, sondern ähm, gerne live ähm, und in Farbe. Wir haben dieses Meeting als Meeting aufgesetzt. Das heißt, ihr seht auch alle anderen, ähm, die teilnehmen, die vielen kleinen Kacheln. Wenn euch das doch zu verwirrend ist am Anfang, kann man oben bei Zoom auf die kleine Ansicht gehen und die umschalten. Ähm, aber sobald wir in die Diskussion treten, würde ich dazu raten, dass wir alle unsere Kacheln so sehen, dass wir uns alle sehen. Ihr kennt sonst die Zoom-Etikett. Wenn ihr nicht sprecht, gerne auf lautlos schalten. Und wenn ihr dann dran seid, gerne das Mikro wieder anmachen. Ich freue mich sehr, dass Verena, du heute mit dabei bist. Verena, du bist... Oha, weißt du, was ich jetzt die ganze Zeit gemacht habe? Ich bin die ganze Zeit im Deutschen unterwegs. But, ich habe mich schon gefragt, wann du umswitcht. But we want to do this in English. <laughs> and I hope that I didn't lose any of our members as I was um, saying everything in English. Um, if, if, um, if I need to repeat anything, just raise your hand. But now we are in English. Um, it is, Verena, you are an entrepreneur. You are a digital educator. Um, you are a founder, an entrepreneur, a publicist. And what I really hear about you, what I know about you, you are a doer a real doer, not just a talker, but you do things. And throughout the Corona crisis, you have initiated so many really, really important um, initiatives um, with regard to digital education. Um, in the first weeks of the Corona crisis, um, you created um, the Digitale Bildung um, für alle, um, creating a platform for everybody who was lost 
um, in the beginning and did not know how to implement homeschooling. And you brought together institutions who usually would not talk to each other, which is really, really impressive. You created Stay On Board um, with the, an initiative um, to keep women um, on boards, um, even if they had to temporarily pause um, because of family reasons or other reasons. And you were named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum in 2018. And not only this, you have uh, uh, published a book. I mean, you, you have written a book, um, which is um, amazing and has been a Spiegel bestseller, Das Neue Land. And now you're also um, today launching a new podcast. And I'm wondering, what have you not done so far? <laughs> and to kick us off, we ask you to bring something along and show to us, like in American schools, show and tell, um, what characterizes you a little bit for us. Yes, thank you for this warm welcome and hello everyone. Um, I would have loved to have met you in person, but this is as good as it gets. And thanks for turning on your cameras because it really makes a difference uh, than looking into black screens. And I liked your first exercise. I actually brought a combination of uh, pink high heels and a soccer, um, a soccer ball. Because I think if I needed two items to characterize myself, then these go a long way. Because I can be this, um, and I love being this at times, but I can be all muddy and, and the opposite of this um, on the soccer court. Uh, I've been playing football since I was five years old. And um, my favorite moments are, when I bring my sons, and my daughter is still too small, to soccer training in this, I don't do that too often, but still, and then I join the parents tournament and everyone thinks like, oh, that's her, she doesn't, I don't want her on my team. And then I turn to this and then I've impressed uh, at least my sons at times by scoring like the first goal in the all male father team. And, and those are then my highlight moments. Thank you so much, and we will come back to this. Um, uh, certainly, I mean, I'm very sure um, latest in the discussion. Um, Verena, you are, um, well, I mean, you have a talent for many things, but one of your great talents um, is identifying um, where something needs to be done. Um, and you did so um, in the beginning of the Corona crisis, looking at well, the days, the very early days um, when schools were closed, um, seeing that most people, most teachers, most institutions and schools were really lost. And then you started to do. Um, what did you do and why did you do it? Well, first thing is uh, when you looked at the first month or weeks of the first lockdown, then I would call myself knowledge workers as I am, felt like what's our contribution to this? We don't work in supermarkets, we don't work in hospitals, we don't work in um, old folks' homes. Um, so this system relevancy, which was a big word in the first lockdown, um, my husband and I turned to each other and said, so what's, what's our contribution? Um, and I think that was when the responsibility came to say, okay, I've been involved into digital education for eight years, and now obviously is a time where everybody's confronted with the question, how do I organize homeschooling? Which software can I use? Um, how can I help the teachers who haven't been really educated for this? And how can I actually make sure that not those kids that already have uh, an unfair chance in our system um, are completely shut off of education and learning. And so I basically took everything which I'd kind of said and done for eight years and put it together on one platform, um, called it Homeschooling Corona, because uh, I used to uh, also have some knowledge about online marketing. And I knew if you call it, I don't know what, tools for um, learning at home, then probably the Google algorithm will need a long time to show. Um, and so homeschooling was the name of the game in this first lockdown. And so this website became very visible very quickly. And the idea was 
to have it as a nonprofit platform, put all the solutions that are out there on it and basically show the parents and the teachers what is adequate for which um, age, what is adequate for which subject and how can I kind of survive in these first months that were a terrible mess for everyone. What does uh, digital education actually mean uh, for you? Because I can remember when I was still at university, I mean, it's quite a long time ago, um, when I was researcher at the university, we started an e-learning platform and <laughs> we put text and text and text on the platform. Um, it was like an e-textbook. Um, so are we beyond that, Verena? What does uh, digital learning mean to you? No, that's a really important question because um, there are two answers to it. Um, I'll answer what I actually think digital education is in a minute, but what it was in the, in the Corona time was more a facilitator. So basically, as you describe it, analog learning or communicating via digital channels, which is not the understanding of digital education for me, but what, which was hugely important. So it was more the infrastructure which we needed, um, school clouds, fast internet devices, which are the basis for digital education. But because the teachers were so way out of their comfort zone with this, because nobody had really taught them before how to use the devices, the internet was slow, many kids at home didn't have a device, it would have been a complete frustration if you would have loaded digital education on top of everything, uh, at least in the first lockdown. So the first lockdown or the Corona time so far was more about digital infrastructure. And I think now that we have kind of um, kicked that off a little bit too late, but now, now it's um, finally happening. I think we can come to digital education, which in my definition is to teach kids creativity, skills, competences in the digital world. So not take a PDF instead of a book, not put text online instead of offline, but really give them tools. Um, and I'll give you an example so everyone knows what, I'm, what I mean. There's, uh, for example, a software that allows you to do um, basically digital um, ah, the, the German word is schnitzeljagd, um, yeah, scavenger hunts or something like that is the word. Um, and what schools did is that the fourth grade did a digital um, hunt for the first graders who had never basically seen the school. Um, to show them around the school, create hotspots where they could get further information, what is going on in this room or, uh, or there. They were able to ask questions. They had a digital mentor um, which showed them around. And this is just one idea. A second is that they created stop motion videos of their school and, and basically showed um, what they learn in, in, for example, science via a, a self-created movie, which the children did. So it's not about reading a text online. It is really about collaborative work online that one child comments, the other one can add to it. You can really exchange ideas and become creative in that space. And this is still yet future. Um, it's still not what is happening right now. But I think it is something where we have all realized that if digital is only consumption or analog methods via digital channels, then that makes learning worse. Um, so what we have to get to is a good mix of analog learning and digital creating. Thank you so much. I mean, this is this is really fascinating. Um, in the in the beginning, when you uh, when you said that there was a lot of confusion. Um, in the early days or weeks of the corona crisis as, uh, of, of, and, and the first lockdown, um, many, many teachers and many schools did not know which, which platforms they were allowed to use, right? I mean, there was a long list of don'ts. <laughs> um, it's not allowed to use Zoom. It's not allowed to use Teams. It's not allowed to use WhatsApp. It's not allowed to. Um, how did you overcome um, all these, these legalistic hurdles in the beginning to kickstart your initiative? Well, first, it's kind of like common sense. What is worse, 
having 2.3 million children at home that have absolutely no contact to their teacher or to learning, or using a platform that might record a video conference where everyone has their videos turned off, where the teacher kind of checks in with every child individually. So the first step to it was, if it was normal times, we would have to take month and month to now certify all the software out there and say, you may use this or you may use that. But as it was really a matter of, are we gonna lose children completely or are we actually still being able to talk to them? Um, I think what I first did is say, okay, let's look at all the European solutions there are. And um, they are all based on our data privacy and data um, security acts. And let's push them forward. So the Hasselblatt Cloud, um, it's learning, I serve, um, all the state clouds like Mebus in Bavaria or um, Logineo in, in North Rhine-Westphalia. Disclaimer, they were all not working in the first lockdown. So everyone, and you will know this in this chat, who were using these platforms had the same message on the Monday morning saying, please don't log in, we're closed. Uh, because the servers weren't hosted that they could scale, they were hosted locally. So I think first thing um, we did is say, push those things forward that are there and that are um, according to the privacy laws. Second thing was, let's push those things forward that are easy to use because if you have to quickly adapt to these new software and platforms now you won't have a lot of time for online webinars and, and things like that and so for example an anton app which many of you will know or a platform like sofa tutor which gave video tutorials to kids where their parents weren't able to um, explain math ninth grade or whatever um, they were the next to to kind of showcase um, because we really put ourselves in the shoes of parents that have a job or two jobs um, that have kids that have absolutely no um, um, child care because the kitas were also closed so so occasionally you also had a three-year-old or a one-year-old at home and you were meant to do your job and to homeschool and kind of think like what does this family or these people need to survive these first mom and and that's how we started and then we filled up with the recommendations out of the community who sent us their input and said i'm actually using this this works really well and i'm actually using that but in the end we also put Microsoft Teams and Zoom and everything on there, because in the first lockdown, for me, it was much worse to think of all the kids that weren't reached at all, than to say like, um, it might be American software, which I'm normally more skeptical about. Mm. And um, on, on the note of skepticism, um, what I sometimes observe, because I also switched from business to think tanks and from think tanks to business, um, sometimes business initiatives are, or initiatives by business people are viewed with a little bit of skepticism. Um, you, overca you, you overcame that pretty quickly and you also worked together with um, the, um, well, with the, not just the federal government, but also the lender governments uh, to get that started. How did, how did you overcome the skepticism? Well, first, um, I have a nonprofit organization called Digitale Bildung für Alle e.V., which is completely nonprofit and where there's absolutely no business behind it. And secondly, the businesses I have been doing in the past, Fox and Sheep, where we do apps for kids, or Haber Digitalwerkstätten, where we teach kids coding and robotics and all that, I, I, I left them as a CEO to end of 2019 and also as a shareholder. So I think if I would have still been CEO or shareholder of these companies, it would have been much tougher, even if I would have done exactly the same nonprofit as I did, because it is true what you say in the minute where entrepreneurs or business people enter the educational space, the first question is, uh, why is she doing that? Yeah, does she want to sell her courses? Uh, does she make money with this? And, and so looking back, it was kind of fate that I ended all that end of 2019 and had this IFAO already since 2017 and then 
had planned for myself to completely concentrate on developing the IFAO because I saw that there was so much action to be taken in that nonprofit field. So in hindsight, that was a really good timing. But on the other hand, I feel it's sad that we still have these prejudices because, I mean, what's worse, helping our country, Europe, out of the middle of our society or leaving it to the big tech American companies to come in, into all fields of our daily doing because we kind of don't let our own people work on solutions. So until today, I don't understand why we don't let uh, education startups and, and uh, European tech companies much more into the schools. Um, because I mean, we sell Schulbücher books all day. They are also for profit. They are not charities. Um, why do we have so many problems with selling digital content into schools? So um, I think, yeah, you're right. Um, it is important that you don't have a business case while you do it. And on the other hand, I'd rather have German or European entrepreneurs entering the schools than um, non-European. That's an, that, that, that. That is a very interesting point and maybe also a controversial point we can discuss later because I mean, absolutely, this is a, trans this is a transatlantic community. Um, and that is a point we have to pick up on later. I think again, um, I, I still want to ask everybody who hasn't turned on their um, cameras, if you can, please do so. It's really nicer to see, to see, uh -huh. <laughs> to see everybody. Um, I also, Verena, it's not, so common um, that um, you have somebody who's so who feels comfortable to work to 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 be and work in different worlds not profit non-profit profit digital non-digital um, very technological you are very tech savvy um, is this something which um, which you were already taught by your family um, in school, or is that something which came later and which she had to, to work for, um, for yourself? I think the humorous answer would be that my father wanted a son and he got me. And so he raised me like a son, but that's only with a smile. Um, and, um, and the real answer is that I, if I look back, um, I had a high affinity to, um, well, it wasn't tech. I was born 1979. It wasn't like techie back in those days, but I had like uh, an Apple computer and I played a Langscheid software on it where you had to, uh, like Pac-Man, find Anonyme and Synonyme, which was uh, shows that it was kind of like an educational game, which was rather boring, but we thought, my sister and I, like, it's as good as it gets, yeah? Better than nothing. So, um so yes, I always, I'm, I'm still until today, um, if, if there's any new tech device or anything technical to be done in our household, everyone looks to me. Um, so it is, it, it's kind of like my field of interest. Um, and did my parents encourage it? I would say they let me be. Uh, so when I was playing soccer um, at the age of five, that wasn't very common that girls played soccer um, and I played it all along. Um, I had super short hair. I was sitting hours and days building Lego. Um, so it wasn't exactly like the typical girl, um, but that never played a role. So they never kind of said like, why don't you do more girls things or why are you only inviting boys to your birthday or something they just let me be and I think this would be my advice today um, looking back that that still has value let children be and kind of show them the range of possibilities but don't try to push them in a direction just because you feel more comfortable in that direction I mean my mother has never played soccer in her life and she's not techie at all so she could have kind of brought me away from it but she was just like well if she's enjoying it um, let's help her live her talent and I think that's nothing new for if you look at childhood today, what we should be doing, looking at children, looking at their talents and trying to encourage them to go all the way. 
It sounds like a really, really loving household. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> Until today. <laughs> it's a household with a, which, which is both very political, but also very entrepreneurial, right? It was very political because, um, as I disclosed it in my book, I, I can also tell you here, my uncle was Johannes Rau, the former um, president um, of, of Germany. And um, my um, great-grandfather was Gustav Heinemann. And so it was an SPD kind of politics uh, environment. And it was a hardcore FDP CDU entrepreneur environment. And that really still clashed in the 80s. So it was not at all that we were just sitting at the table and, and, and exchanging ideas or something. It was, and you were still called Zotzis and Bonson and I don't know what, what they threw over the table. And um, what it did with me was, um, First of all, there is the statistic that the most people vote what their parents vote um, or they vote what they learned at home. And if you learn at home that there's quite the opposite um, on both sides of the table, you, you, I think, start to make up your own mind about things more. Um, and uh, I still, but still, I remember when my husband and I met and he has voted for the Greens uh, all his life. Uh, the first two years, he was like, oh my God. Oh. Uh, Verena, we lost you. Um, we can't hear you anymore. <laughs> No, unfortunately. Hmm. <laughs> Maybe uh, you log off and you log in. Ah. Oh, that's the beauty of those Zoom meetings. Um, there we go. Are you back? Yeah, I'm back. I don't know Perfect. why iPod, AirPods lie here all the time. I don't know why they interfered. Um, yes, so I, I, the last thing I said was um, when my husband and I met and he voted Greens all his life. The first two years we were like, shall we tell your dad, my dad, or shall we not? So uh, although it was a very uh, broad upbringing in a political way, it's, it's obviously still politics and people have different opinions about it. When, um, when you were in your 20s, um, you um, already, I mean, you had a lot of power um, and a lot of ideas. And um, one of the ideas, I, if I'm correct, was that women can make it also without a quota. Um, we don't need it. Um, we don't need to be pushed into boards or so on. Um, if we are good enough, we are going to get there. And I think you changed your opinion a little bit. And um, for everybody who was at the Munich Security Conference the last weekend or, or, or took a look into the uh, social media channels, you might have seen one picture. Um, that was the uh, CEO uh, Munich, Security Cyber, uh, Munich Security Conference uh, CEO luncheon. And it was a table with, I would say 30, 35, rather white and older CEOs sitting around the table without a single woman around it. And um, Verena, I wanted to ask you about the state um, in Germany of, of the business world and representation of women. Um, and also if we need a quota or if we don't need a quota. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so first thing is, I think when you're younger, at least that was my thing. I was like, I don't need a quota. Um, women can make it to the top without a quota. And then you grow older and older, and then you see that it doesn't really happen. Um, they don't make it to the top. Um, and then you feel like, can that be because they're all not qualified? That's strange, because if I look at all my um, student friends and all my friends at school and all my female friends in life, they're all really smart. So how come at some stage they don't make it to the top? And then um, 
I kind of not only a little bit changed my mind, I, I felt like, is it really so bad to have a quota? Uh, because then qualified women will make it to the top. And if they're not qualified, then they will be exchanged hopefully by other qualified women. So it kind of brings a dynamic uh, to the table, which isn't there because if you don't have to look for a woman, you don't look for a woman. And I've experienced this in a lot of boards, uh, which I am on that in the moment where the female quota is actually 30%, it's kind of like this moment of, huh, now we can look for men again. And until then, it was like, okay, let's look for women. And so I feel like a quota isn't at all as bad as I always thought. And the same goes also with the word feminist. I had so many problems with that word in my 20s because I was like, I really like to work with men. I really like men. I feel like mixed teams are a great asset. And for me, being a feminist in my 20s meant like I don't like men because I felt like that was my connotation of this word. Now, I feel like being a feminist, uh, and, and especially also if you're a man, is like the coolest thing in the world because you are a, a, an ambassador for equal rights of men and women. You are someone who says life, economy, politics work best when both sexes work together. And I can see nothing wrong with that. And if I now uh, teach my kids, I would say like, especially to the boys, of course you're feminists. And then they look at me and say, of course we are. Like, if that's the definition of the word, of course we are. And so I think all that has become much more normal and much less political than it has been. And referring to your picture and, and the status quo we're in, I don't, I don't at all blame those 35 men around that table because they were invited and they came. And I without knowing all of them, but I know some of them know that in that minute where they sat there, they felt awkward too, because that's not their reality. But now that this picture is out there and let's always take the things for the good and stop like bashing this picture. I've seen it too many times in the last days and take action and say, okay, and many have done so, this is the last time we want this picture. So please put 30 female CEOs and, and, and um, DAX board members and MDAX board members onto that list next year. And if they are not all in security or a very a niche industry where there might not already be enough women, then let's expand kind of like the focus of this lunch because I think it is worse to have a complete homogeneous group looking at the world, especially in shaky times like these. And it is less a risk that if the one comes from the automotive industry and the other one uh, comes from the chemical industry, she will also have a very good take on the Ukraine and the Russia crisis right now. Mm. Yeah, no, no, thank you so much. Um, I, would, I really would also now like to open it up for questions. Um, and um, what we also sometimes do um, in these meetings, I spring a question on somebody from our, um, <laughs> our participants who I know as an icebreaker um, have a lot to say um, on the topic. And um, if, um, if we were in the same room, um, Margaret would already see that I'm targeting you, Margaret. <laughs> Because I know that you have been doing um, a lot with regard to diversity um, and you are also coming from a sector which is not always so easy. Margaret. Yeah, thanks, uh, Stormy. Um, yeah, indeed. I mean, you know, I'm working in financial services, uh, so there's definitely a lot to be done there. Um, and, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot happening as well, but it's certainly not there yet. But actually, my question would rather be on, you know, the first half of the conversation, Verena, um, in terms of um, teaching skills to kids. And, um, you know, I was wondering if um, there's also some sort of track to teach them how to deal with their mental health now, because uh, they've been in so much turmoil and you know and you know they've you know sometimes you know maybe uh, have been coming from uh, you know troubled uh, surroundings 
um, you know, they, the world is opening up again, you know, maybe they at any time soon are allowed to not wear the masks again. So that they are, you know, there's, there's, there's now hopefully soon some time to digest everything that happened. And I was wondering if there's already um, offerings um, for kids on how to deal with their mental health um, in, in a digital way, um, because yeah. maybe there's not enough funding to come together and really talk about it. Yeah, so it's definitely true what you say, there's not enough funding and there's just not enough capacity to come together in person. I think one of the big bottlenecks right now is um, clinics, psychotherapists and all that, um, that they're enough to serve all the kids out there. So digital solutions, um, are a very good solution versus none. And I think this is always important because there are many skeptics who say you can't help children via digital tools on these very sensitive topics. But if you look at, for example, Krisenchat, um, which is a nonprofit which made a huge uh, impact in the Corona times, it is uh, an app where basically the child can raise her or his hand and say, I'm not fine. I'm in danger or I'm physically harmed or I'm just mentally um, really um, suffering after all this lockdown and, and deprivation I had. And that then has experts. It has people who the child um, gets transferred to. It's like kind of a platform that takes care of you and gives you this feeling there's somebody out there to help. And I think that's like the Kinder und Jugendtelefon or um, everything that was there in my childhood now digitally. And they also launched an app called Exclamo, which before Corona made it possible for children to say if they were mobbed. And I think digital tools for children for these very sensitive topics have a much lower barrier um, to use than to go to a person in person. Um, and so um, it is a really good news that Krisenchat is supported by the state or by all the federal um, ministries because it um, and, and also this, uh, the, the Bundesländer because it is really a great solution. And um, so you're absolutely right. It's a huge problem. We need more than Krisenchat because they won't be able to manage everything. And we have to start putting a line on the corona and also looking at the impact it had on children be beyond the actual sickness because that is where the problem only starts right now um, and that's something where we need a lot of attention of, of everyone um, to make sure children are fine after corona Stormy, you're muted. Sorry, I was so diligent of muting myself not to create any noise. <laughs> I thought my AirPods went on again. I thought it was me. <laughs> no, this time it was me. Thanks so much uh, for, for um, our diligent Emily, um, one of the organizers of today and one of our um, Aspen team members. Um, so Hasnain, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good evening. I hope my voice is clear enough. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you very much uh, for an excellent, excellent talk and organizing uh, for the organizers as well, the Aspen Institute. Thank you very much. I am connecting from Erfurt University at the Willy Brandt School of Public Policy, and I look after the digitalization of teaching, uh, which is my subject as well. Now, I would like to come to what Verena earlier said and would appreciate it. Uh, you said that if digital education is only about consumption of analog education, then it only make things worse. And I think that is the most important takeaway from our today's discussion on digitalization. My question to you, Verena, actually are two. Um, number one is, um, and there could be multiple answers for that, but I'm more interested in knowing your background and how deeply you have been committed to the subject of digitalization. In Germany, we are very proud of achieving so many things within the digital and tech sector. There are so many things that have been done in communication technologies. But when we look at these past two years, we certainly realized, and as you have mentioned, that 
there were at the school level we lacked the digital capacity the children as well as the teachers what do you think in your opinion that went wrong here in this part of digitalization story of germany because and like i said they can they can be multiple answers to this but since yeah. you dealt with this subject what do you think second question is when you talk about this collaborative work i had this discussion with the university of bauhaus weimar colleagues and they were sort of or i had a feeling that they were sort of skeptical of this too much of collaboration via internet because they were afraid of this cyber bullying concept as well when students start to become a little bring in bullying aspect into cyber world as well so these two points if you can briefly touch upon yeah. them thank you very much yeah so to your first question number one is we're experts at making funding very bureaucratic so we got a digital pact a digital pact and um, it had a lot of money in it and we could have started to push it to the schools very quickly in in the in the beginning of 2019 but every single school and we have 43000 had to come up with a concept of what they would use the money for and we're talking about 27000 euros which were back then in that budget so it's not like you were building a universe at the school yeah you were just buying a few desktops laptops or tablets because it was only for hardware and and fast internet it was not for software it was not for devices for teachers it was not for education uh, so so training the trainer so this is number one the problem was so slow at making money work we're so proud of saying we have five billion digital pact and then we kind of sit back and say okay we've done it we have five billion but that that is actually worth nothing if it doesn't reach the schools is like the second thing and and still after corona or it's not after but now today only one billion has actually reached the schools and it has been extended to 7 billion during the corona time so even now where there is no doubt that we need it we were still so slow so this is one reason and the second one is our mindset if you went to parents evenings before corona and i didn't only go to my own children we did like a survey among many 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 parents didn't really want digital to get uh, to to have its way into schools and for very good reasons, because they said, okay, we already have enough digital consumption at home with our kids. The last thing we now want is that they also use devices in class to have analog learning via digital devices. And so bring your own device sounds like the hugest threat because they'll be playing Fortnite under the table. And I think that is very legitimate to have this kind of fear, but that is where we have to really say, no, digital education is not about bringing your own device. I'm not a fan of that. I'm a fan of give your smartphone at the door to the teacher and you get it back after school because we didn't bring comics to our lessons when we were kids. Um, but you get a device in school where we teach you digital education. And um, that also gives everyone the same hardware and it doesn't matter if you're from a, a financially strong household and you have an apple whatever or you have an android it's it's kind of the same basis so i think money and mindset are the main reasons why we're slow and corona has in that case done something positive because money has speeded up and mindset has changed to okay we get it that we need it as a digital infrastructure and we get it that it shouldn't only be analog uh, via digital. So let's take the next step now. And to your second question, it's funny that they say that because I would say, um, first of all, why would behavior online be different than offline? I remember my students groups where we came together and the one was lazy, the other one knew everything, the third one kind of said, that's not very smart what you just said. So that's kind of a phenomenon which is independent of analog or digital. And I think it only shows we need a digital netiquette or rules and we need digital competencies, how we work together online but we can't say, let's not do it digital because there might be bullying. I would always say, let's do it digital and prevent bullying by teaching the people how to do that. Thank you so much. Um, I will hand over to Daphne in a second. 
but I want to remind everybody, um, get into the discussion and don't do so five minutes before we have to end, because that is a, a phenomenon I witness a lot. Um, first, everybody is very quiet, and then you have 10 questions five minutes before you end. And there's um, no question you can't ask. Yeah, I'm very open about anything. You can also criticize me. You can say I, I'm not at all uh, agreeing to what you said. So just shoot it out. And I will hand over to Daphne in a second. Um, and um, I want to, um, just as a reminder, what I also want to talk to you uh, with you about Verena is artificial intelligence and teaching. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is something I really also want us to touch about, uh, where there is room and necessity, but might, might also be some dangers. But first, over to Daphne. Thank you. I hope my audio working works. Um, I didn't have the time to test it. Um, I was wondering if we had at least for, for primary schools, because so I'm the mother of two primary school kids, um, a mixed problem of, you know, lack in digitalization and a problem with uh, stereotypes of female interests and behaviors. Um, because what I witnessed during school lockdowns was uh, two different phenomena. First, digital teaching is just not illiteracy proof. And of course, my first grader was illiterate. So there was no way of him handling things alone, really. Um, and the other was that um, the grade school, the, the primary school teachers, they did try many different things. They were quite willing to, to take risks in terms of, you know, uh, privacy policy and what, uh, um, the, what, what the ministry would actually say to them using different tools. Um, but they obviously had no knowledge of um, how to use those tools in teaching. Um, so it was more a kind of, okay, how can we empl employ these tools? Um, how can we make it work for a bunch of small children who would need really, would need more personal interaction and would need um, more um, the feeling of really having a teacher sitting or seeing what they're doing, not necessarily sitting beside them, but, but taking note of what they're actually doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder, because I saw it for the older children where you had more male teachers who might be, you know, in this uh, realm of uh, working with the CCC or being more computer literate in total. Um, that they had less of a problem of didact uh, didactics um, in, in using in usually um, in, in teaching digitally. I wouldn't agree to that, um, that male or female teachers uh, differed in general, because, for example, I could now come up with 10 examples mm. of, of female teachers that not only, and, and they weren't at, at our school, they were like Germany wide putting their uh, things and advice on Twitter, Instagram, um, make, doing webinars, uh, building Trello boards and so on. Um, but where I do agree is that it is that they are much less literate male and uh, female in teaching younger kids so that it was much easier to to um, teach second graders and say like um, here's the task here are the tools if you have questions we're all in a video conference just get back to me and off you go and for first and second graders I mean they'd never seen school the first graders and then they sat there and couldn't write or read and then a video conference or, is already a huge thing for them so um, there absolutely the main problem was and what makes it worse is that um, you had much less uh, fast internet and devices at primary schools mm -hmm. so if you look at which schools are better equipped then it is the secondary schools um, and so you also have much more training for the teachers in the secondary schools so you're absolutely right that the first graders were like those that suffered the most if they had if they didn't have parents that could help in any way and, and that's now also interesting going forward, uh, like there's so much lacking on of foundation, which you normally teach in first and second grade for many kids. And, and how are we going to compensate and not just regarding content, it doesn't matter if you skipped a topic, but like the, the core competences yeah. they need to <laughs> learn in these first two years. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much. Um, Verena, if I may now come to the issue of artificial intelligence um, in teaching, is there room for artificial intelligence or more data? Oh, there definitely should be in the future because let's demystify artificial intelligence when it comes to teaching. Um, it is basically having algorithms and software that knows which child needs what. Um, it is not in a Chinese way saying we monitor each child and face expression and, and depending on that, we give grades. Um, and so if digital education is not only a competency, a competency, but also a tool for the teacher to free her or him from having to give knowledge to 30 different pupils, but can actually concentrate on being kind of a learning coach who goes around, who individually helps, who does um, a synthesis, a synthesis of what has just been learned, then artificial intelligence learning um, is so much better than putting a video onto the wall and saying, here is how you subtract um, whatever in math. And then 30 kids of, of 10 of them already knew that 10 uh, learn it with this video and 10 have absolutely no clue what this video is about. So um, if you look at artificial intelligence solutions, 99 out of 100 come from non-European software development developers. And this is also, again, this European phenomenon on we don't like artificial intelligence because we don't really understand it. So we don't encourage people to work um, with schools together on this topic. So we leave this field entirely for others. And at some point we're, we have no choice than to use what's there. And this is what I don't like about the European approach of sovereignty get your developers on your own software instead of always bashing it until we've kind of given the field entirely to someone else. When um, or since the Corona crisis, what we've seen on the internet and social media um, is an increase of misinformation, hate speech, um, and also conspiracy theories and also echo, echo chambers. Um, and at least some of it, it's also, I mean, there are wonderful sites of social media and the internet, obviously, but there are also some downsides. And totally. um, is, is this a danger for digital teaching? Um, is, is there a danger for, for misinformation, discrimination in digital learning? It's a danger for, the, for our democracies. Um, if we don't educate our children to differentiate between fake news and real news and conspiracy and truth, it is going to be very difficult to push truth uh, to our citizens. And um, in my eyes, it's one of the main topics that belongs into schools to take videos of their favorite YouTubers and not of some theoretical something but take like the most trending youtube or discord or twitch or whatever video put it on the wall and say let's see what is fact here what is opinion where did he get his facts from or she um, can we verify them and what do you actually think and i think this exercise with 12 year plus who are constantly on social media and who don't get the chance to learn right or wrong there because their parents often don't really know what platform they're on um, is one of the crucial elements but we can't leave our teachers alone with that we have to train them for it because it's not easy and and so you're absolutely right it's a threat for our democracies so that's why i wanted a bundeszentrale für digitale bildung because i feel like it's the basis of being able to vote in the future that you actually know where the truth lies and and who are you going to vote for um i'm <laughs> i'm glad that you mentioned uh, influencers because we had just or we were just finishing a project with influencers good, good. where we are talking about the responsibility for influencers yeah. um but it's not it wasn't an easy project though I have to say it was very but it's so important it's so important we have to start talking to the people that influence our kids and not push them aside of this is this crazy youtuber he talks in a very weird language uh, I, I i don't want my child to listen to this yeah but she or he is listening 
-hmm. and and so we rather put them onto into the middle of our family table and say okay this uh, paluten you're also always listening to tell me about him and um, so what is he saying about the upcoming election well the now past election yeah and um, what else is he doing and do you think that's cool or not and and let's start a discussion with our kids about their life and not try to push our very analog life to them because they will turn away and say mommy thanks for that discussion but it has absolutely nothing to do with what i do digitally and online now arno has been very patient uh, waiting for your turn now it is thank you um i want to like uh, like to raise a difficult point because um so um my kids are at private school and i know many parents have their kids at private schools and uh, the Parents from that schools are very quiet about this topic during the last few years. And the reason is, on private schools, we don't have that issue. Digital, digital learning is working perfectly. My kids not lost, left a single lesson during the last two years. So the parents and the schools are more or less quiet. So what, where is it coming from? Why is it so? So when, when my kids are now 18, when they started to go to school, I was involved in, a, in, in looking for the right school and I figured out school system is just not flexible enough. We are looking for bilingual school, for, which is open for, for digitalization and everything. And this was, and was not possible. We looked at that time when we started the company about uh, the, the, the school, about opportunities for school software and everything. And there was already 10, 15 years ago, a lot of movement within German for digital education systems. But if you look what happened out of them, what happened there, it's, it's a hell right. Millions have been wasted for nothing. It's unbelievable. That's why private schools, they all went their own way. And that worked out. So my question is, as I know, it, it is working if you really want and if you're flexible enough. Where's the issue? Why it's not working at the moment on the public schools? My feeling, 15, 10 years ago, um, the, uh, <clears throat> and this is a difficult one to say, uh, these are, um, so the, 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 the not movement was pretty much driven from um, unions of teachers and uh, local interests. Um, Within, within Germany. And I would like to know if this has changed and what are the, the hurdles today? Yeah. So number one, um, I absolutely agree with your analysis on private schools, um, but um, it is a matter of funding. If private schools and one of my sons, yeah, it is. One of my sons goes to a private school and they did a, um, a basically uh, a call for devices and said, um, can, those who can buy an own device, please buy an own device. The others, please say if they can co-fund other devices. And uh, the result was 100% of the kids have a device and 80% of the devices were bought by the parents. Okay, it might be different at your school. Um, yeah, do you want to object? Yes, what is a device? I think this is a very important question. I would say they do, uh, for the first year, they did 90% in the cell phone. And if you're whatever, you're in a gymnasium or higher school, show me a kid which is not having a cell phone. They all can. No, many people, many kids have cell phones, but um, there's a lot of software, especially the one that really teaches them things that is not possible on a smartphone, and especially I not if they're different. Agree. I fully agree. But um, if, if we are coming from zero, we want to go to 100%. There are lots of steps in between. Okay, okay let's put difficulty. let's put funding uh, besides and disagree, agree to disagree. Um, and, but the second point is why isn't it working in the state schools? Because we have to go to the big levers, and one is that there is a cooperationsverbot between the federal, state, and and the countries, the the lender, and that means you can't put federal money into schools for the digital pack that was changed but only for that and when it came to filters software um, whatever else the federal state is not allowed to give money to the schools and so we need an Änderung des Grundgesetzes which is much bigger than just um, opening it for a tiny little piece 
And it doesn't mean that suddenly the lender have no more take in what they're allowed to do. It just means we can take, we can put education on a national level and say, this is so important to us that we really want to have it um, as a state interest and that the Bildungsminister or minister can actually do something. So that's one. And the second is we have a Kultusminister conference which is absurd because it's just 16 people sitting around a table. Nobody can take a decision. Everyone talks uh, about what they do. Nobody looks at best practice. They have no budget for innovation. They have no budget for software, which could where every 16 could benefit from. And this is for me, a group of the past. Either we bring it to the present and the future and say, here's money, competences and decision power, or we get rid of it. And may I, may I add that I really like to thank you to compare the software solutions which you all list on your website with the book, because this is exactly the book for tomorrow. But the minister president and the lender, they have to look at the software and they have to yeah. tick them and say, yes, you can use yeah. it. And I have the feeling they don't do it. But they, whatever. I have no idea why it's not happening. Private schools can do this on their own without asking anyone. Yeah. State and schools can't. Unfortunately, we ha already have hit the uh, six o'clock mark, but um, Ralf has been um, also waiting for such a long time. Verena, I know that uh, your husband is coming back tonight. Um, from, from Would you still give us five more minutes? Well, he, he comes back. That's not like a big event, but now he's gone, uh, he's been gone for nine days. Generally, I don't celebrate my husband coming back home yeah. every night, but... Uh, <laughs> but five more minutes? Yes, yes. Um, Ralf. Yeah, good evening. Hello. Thank you. Uh, just a very short comment. It's a good combination between Daphne and Verena, your comment on the um, schools in Hamburg. I know it from the Hamburg School. I have, I have verbally listened to the statement from the senator for schools saying that the bandwidth for primary schools is limited to 500 MB and the bandwidth for the next level school is, limit, is enlarged to 1000 MB. That shows me the very clear mindset on the school senator about the priority in his eyes on digitalization and clearly saying we won't get back to analog to front room room. They don't see any, he hasn't any perspective on digitalization. And if the lead does not come from the top, how should then the school convert around? I think they are totally losing support of this. It's mindset, it's not technology, it's not, it's mindset and skill. That's just You're my absolutely problem. right. You're absolutely right. And that's why we took the approach via Wir für Schule. If you look at that website, wirfürschule.de, we said, okay, we can either sit here and moan or we can team up with thousands that see it differently because then politics have to listen. And that's exactly what happened. We didn't ask them for the Schirmherrschaft first because they would have said like, who are you? We don't need to talk to you. We came up with over 6,000 participants of our hackathon and said, uh, would you like to have the Schirmherrschaft? You don't have to, we're gonna do it anyway. And I think that's this bottom up democracy which in digital times with Hashtags, petitions, social media is so much easier than it has been in the past because politicians know they have to listen if, if uh, via Twitter or hashtags or the media things come up. And so I would always say if you see a problem, team up with as many people as you can start a, a, a crowd a petition on change.org or come up with a cool hashtag because that is really what makes them listen. Thank you very, very much, Verena. This has been a, um, a wonderful talk um, and, and very insightful and inspirational. Where can we listen to your new podcast? Yes, we announced it today. So I put the launch date to today. No, it, it was a coincidence, but it starts next week. It's called Fast and Curious. I'm very proud of the title because it's not that easy to find a podcast title these days after millions of podcasts already out there. And I teamed up with a, a very cool uh, female entrepreneur, Lea Sophie Kramer, and we said, let's make all this tacit knowledge about founding companies, investing as a business angel, um, looking at new trends and business models in the industry so accessible 
that you actually listen and learn and not feel small and and I don't know afterwards and think like, oh my God, they're also smart and I'm not. Because this is the problem I sometimes have with podcasts that I feel like good for you that you know all that, but I still haven't understood it. So our approach is uh, to explain things uh, fast, to be cur curious what's going on. Is NFTs a hype or should you look closer at it? If you look closer, where to look? So so uh, a business podcast uh, from two female entrepreneurs so that we don't need a quota anymore in the future. Well, we are certainly going to listen to it. Um, Marlies, um, who is one of my team members, uh, maybe you wave so everybody sees you. Mm -hmm. um, she has been responsible, responsible for putting together this talk and she thought that we should close every fireside chat with a three question round, a fast one. And um, so, Verena, what is it? A book or a podcast? Well, today it's a podcast and it's, it's my new podcast to be a little bit marketing salesy. <laughs> is it online or offline? It's offline for the soul and online for inspiration and new ideas. And paper book or ebook? Paper book. I love oh. paper book. <laughs> I, I do. like there's the Kindle on my uh, side of my bed. It's just there for romantic reasons or not even romantic. It's a, 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 no, museums reasons. I've never used it. I always read paperback. That makes for very heavy luggage when you're on vacation. Yes. Uh, my family hates it. We have four kids and half of the suitcase is filled with books. <laughs> I can only say thank you so much. Um, the, the title of your, your podcast was Fast and Curious is wonderful. Um, you are also fast and furiously intelligent, accessible, nice, wow. insightful, and inspirational. Thank you so very, very nice much for being here today. <laughs> it was lovely being here. Thank you all for your questions and your happy faces. That makes a difference uh, if people smile while you're talking. And uh, yeah, maybe we have a chance to meet in person in the future. I very much hope so. And I uh, hope to see everybody else on our na la uh, next uh, fireside chat, maybe in person. And if we are lucky, um, uh, all still very, very healthy. I think this is something we always have to say. Stay healthy. See you soon. Thank you so much for being here tonight. <laughs> and thank bye you bye. so much, Verena. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>